Ever since we can remember, mankind has always been fascinated by the existence of extraterrestrials, represented in our collective imagination as little green aliens. Planet Earth appears to be the perfect place for their little stealth visits. Between kidnappings and strange lights in the sky, sightings of UFOs have increased more and more over the years, together with the testimonies of those who have been affected. Today we shall investigate a lesser known, but no less significant, incident. It is one of the most extraordinary cases of UFO sightings and occurred in the Sagrada Familia district in Belo Horizonte, city and capital of the state of Minas Gerais in Brazil. The protagonists of our story are three boys who claim to have been contacted by an extraterrestrial, a being of humanoid appearance, but unlike many other cases, it would appear to be a giant cyclops, almost two and a half meters tall. During the latest wave of UFO observations, in mid-1965, a more than surprising news item was published by the famous Belo Horizonte newspaper, O Diario. According to the article, three children had seen, two years earlier in 1963, a strange flying object with several crew members in their own yard outside their home. Immediately after reading the article, Mr. Alberto Francisco Docarmo, partner of Chicoani, the Center for Civil Investigation of Unidentified Flying Objects, a Brazilian ufology organization founded by Julio Brandt Alexo in 1954, went to the boys' home to investigate the case. From this investigation that we are going to analyze, a classic case of Brazilian ufology emerged. After spending a long period with the three boys and their parents in the same place where the incident allegedly occurred, this is what emerges from the report drawn up by Mr. Locarno. The brothers Fernando and Ronaldo, aged 14 and 7 respectively, like many other families, live in a small house on the outskirts of the city, with four or five rooms, together with their parents and four other siblings. As they do every evening, immediately after dinner, they go out into the backyard together with their friend Marcos, also 7 years old, who lives on the second floor of a small house on the corner of the street. That evening their intent, like many other evenings, at their mother's request, is to wash an old coffee pot with water from a cistern located next to a small well in their backyard. Going out into the yard through the back door, down the small stone staircase, the older boy, Fernando, notices how well lit it is, but doesn't give it much thought, as the moon is shining brightly in the sky. The courtyard is also a kind of garden full of flowers, with its well and small bushes and well-kept flower beds, together with some fruit trees, an avocado tree and a mango tree. Their friend Marcos, always the first to want to do things, quickly approaches the old oil barrel, used for many years as a water tank. 
The barrel is almost empty, so the boy moves to the small well next to it to collect the water needed for their task. The wall of the well is quite high and the boy has to lean inside to operate the lever to lower the bucket and collect the water at the bottom. He leans in so far that his head can hardly be seen, only his back and legs emerge from the well. Ronaldo, on the other hand, the younger brother, left further back to the side of the house, is the first to be truly surprised at how well lit the courtyard is, despite the fact that the old and worn lamp is turned off. Raising his head to understand better, Ronaldo sees the most amazing thing in the world. Floating in mid-air above the courtyard, high enough not to have been noticed initially by his friend intent on collecting the water, a spherical object is floating. Illuminated from the inside and with transparent walls. It is motionless above an avocado tree planted in front of the house. About five meters from the ground and eight meters from the boys watching it. It is divided into small squares. Probably a checkerboard structure, the investigator Do Cormo hypothesizes. As if paralyzed by what he is seeing, Ronaldo observes the sphere speechless. In the upper part, there is a kind of antenna, consisting of two inclined rods in the shape of a V, surmounted by two spheres and a central vertical rod. Ronaldo is no longer the only one to observe that miraculous sphere. Managing to temporarily take his eyes off that mesmerizing sight, he notices that even his brother, who stopped shortly after entering the courtyard, has raised his head and remains, like him, almost paralyzed by what he sees. The most terrifying thing, however, for Ronaldo, who has turned back to look at the floating sphere, is that, through its transparent walls, four people sitting on one-legged stools can be seen, at the moment in profile, with respect to the boys. One of the people sitting in the back seat has a more masculine appearance and is more robust than the others. Right in front of it, in the center of the sphere, what appears to be a woman is seated. The children, in fact, notice long blonde hair pulled back in a hairstyle similar to the one they often see their mothers use when they go to mass. Sitting in the front seat is a man more similar to the first, but much thinner. Who seems to operate, now Ronaldo notices, instruments on what the child can only define as a control panel. Not too different from that of an airplane, as he had seen on a TV series a few days earlier. In front of this is a kind of screen similar to a television. The fourth man, or rather being, who the children would soon see much more closely, sits on the left side of the woman, in the center of the floating object. All four appear to be wearing some kind of diving suit that is very adherent to their body and have their heads wrapped in round, transparent domes or helmets. Their clothing is also very similar and uniform, as the children will describe even better in their drawings. Their torso is covered in something brown, and below the waist, the clothes are white until they reach the knees, where there are some black protuberances going down to the feet, which the boys assume are black boots. 
What now both Ronaldo and his brother Fernando can identify as the crew uniforms appear to be made of leather and are very worn in the parts corresponding to the limbs and chest. Probably, the boys think, they have been used a lot or are second hand like almost all the clothes that have been passed to Ronaldo by his brothers. In a matter of seconds, before the two brothers can even warn their friend Marcos, still intent on collecting water from the well, two beams of light, parallel to each other and with a yellowish colour, split the air under the floating device, projecting themselves towards the ground, in the blink of an eye, near a flower bed. Without any perceptible noise, a hatch below the sphere opens, with two parts sliding in opposite directions. Among these two large beams full of bright light, one of the men, or rather one of the beings, inside the spacecraft makes its descent to the ground, floating upright until it gently touches the beaten soil of the courtyard. The brothers can now fully see that strange creature that resembles a man. After placing both feet on the ground, they notice that the being does not look around and does not seem disoriented. Perhaps floating on the ground is a daily activity for him, the eldest thinks. Instead, the being heads, without delay, towards Ronaldo and Fernando, who, still motionless, almost as if glued to their home and still stunned by the event, have not warned their friend Marcos. Marcos, with his head completely stuck in the well and having not yet noticed anything, is unaware of the situation. The being moves with a heavy and cadenced gait. Its arms swing a little away from its body and it reminds Ronaldo of when carrying his brother on his back for fun, he crossed that same courtyard with a similar pace. Perhaps this being is weighed down with something or is not used to walking on the earth. The brothers soon realise that the being has not noticed their presence and is instead moving towards the side of the well, towards their friend Marcos, and stopping shortly before reaching him, it extends an arm towards the boy. As the children will later hypothesise, that may have actually been a harmless gesture, perhaps even of kindness on the part of that strange creature, who, seeing the child almost swallowed by the well, wanted to help him, therefore extending a hand towards him to pull him up. But Fernando, as if awakened from a trance and immediately interpreting the being's gesture as a threat to his still distracted companion, rushes, running towards the cistern and jumps on Marcos, throwing him violently to the ground to avoid being grabbed. Marcos now finds himself dazed, surprised and lying on the ground, trying to understand what happened. He turns, at first angry, towards his friend who dragged him to the ground, then, following Fernando's gaze, lying on the ground next to him, he too sees the strange visitor for the first time. The being who has remained motionless turns his gaze from Fernando to his brother Ronaldo. The boy, who in the meantime had managed to move back a little in the courtyard with the intention of taking refuge in the house, breaks into a run, but stumbles and slams his knee painfully on the corner of the door. Falling to the ground, his leg throbbing in pain, he is forced to stop. The groans of pain, even if subdued, attract the attention of the being, who stops to stare at the child. Ronaldo manages to get up and takes a few steps backwards, staggering slightly, to then remain passively at the side of the house. The boy and his two companions will in fact remember that peculiar state of mind. 
they felt powerless to run away or even just to scream and call someone for help. The being, however, does not approach the boys, but instead begins to gesticulate with its hands, short and fluid gestures, extending its hands horizontally, accompanying these gestures with head movements and strange words in a language unknown to the boys. Fernando, having found the courage to get up after pushing his friend to the ground, is overwhelmed by a new sensation. After various gestures by the being, his fear, which previously immobilized him and made his legs tremble, has disappeared. Like him, the other two boys are also calmer, and finally, just over two meters away from the strange visitor, they can finally observe it better. It has reddish skin and is completely hairless, like two of its companions still in the floating sphere. It doesn't have a single hair. The boys certainly know bald people in their neighborhood, but it is still a peculiar vision. The figure is huge, Fernando notes, almost as big as the door on the side of the house. And he knows that door well. He and his brothers measure themselves against it every year on their birthday. Once, to be able to understand how much he would have to grow to get to reach the top, with the help of his father, he had measured the entire length of the door. 220 centimeters. Therefore, the strange being standing before them was more than two meters tall. Above what now stands out better as a transparent helmet, there is a kind of small ring-shaped antenna with a small hanging sphere. But by far the most surprising and strange thing that all the children can see very well is its eye. One single large eye placed in the center of the face. They will not remember the nose or ears, maybe they didn't even have them, but the eye, that is unforgettable. A round and dark eye, devoid of its white part. The thing that strikes Marco the most, and that he will continue to remember for a long time, is the pupil. Instead of a circular pupil, like human eyes, the being only had a much darker horizontal line as the central part of the eye. Above that big ball that is the eye, there is a dark and large area, not well defined, but that moves frequently, which the boys interpret as a thick eyebrow. The clothes the being is wearing, that kind of suit, cover its whole body and appear slightly swollen to the boys. They will hypothesize later that perhaps, after the fluctuating descent a little earlier, the suit had filled up with air. With short steps, the being moves a little, always staggering slightly, in contrast to the naturalness with which it had made its descent to the ground, and it sits on the edge of the well. The boys see it in profile, and it is located more or less, in front of that strange spherical device similar to a spacecraft, where its companions remain seated. The height of its head far exceeds the height of the handle of the pulley of the well, Fernando notes, and taking advantage of the apparent distraction of the being, he takes a few steps backwards, positioning himself behind the being, in order to be out of its field of view. Crouching slightly, he picks up a piece of brick from the ground and raises his arm to throw it at the being. Taking advantage of his position, he would have hit the being from behind without being seen. I wanted to hit him, Fernando later confessed in a subsequent interview. Inexplicably, however, 
as if it had sensed it without even seeing it, the being jumps to its feet, turns towards the boy with a quick movement and expels from a rectangular surface placed at chest height a jet of yellow light which, in the blink of an eye, reaches the boy's hand. Without Fernando realising it, his hand trembles and goes limp, making the brick fall to the ground. The boys notice that the being exchanges a quick glance with the sphere floating above them, receiving a quick gesture from its companion sitting in the front seat, in charge of the instrumentation, interpreted by the children as a gesture of deterrence. At that moment, the boys can see more clearly that this other crew member also has only one eye. In the brief moment in which the being in front of them has turned and has its back to them, the boys notice the existence of a copper-coloured box on the being's back, attached to its clothes. You know that colour that appears when you peer at an electrical wire? Fernando will then ask, trying to describe the colour of the box. Turning to the boys once again, after that brief exchange with its partner in the spacecraft, the being tries to communicate something to them. A very strange language, an extremely deep voice and a lot of gesturing with its hands, head and eye. The being seems to make an effort to make itself understood by the children, who can only watch it passively. By creating a circle with its index finger and thumb, the being traces different circles in the air around it, and he does the same with the index finger of the other hand, all this without stopping talking. Subsequently, after taking a short break, probably to catch his breath, he points to the three boys and, with some difficulty, as Fernando notices, tries to join the palm of its hands next to its head. The classic gesture that is made when you want to express that you are sleepy or want to go to bed, concludes Ronaldo. After which, the being points to the moon with a not too rapid gesture and a progressive hand elevation as if to indicate a flight in that direction. The children cannot understand what the being wants to say to them, but they stare at it. As if it had finally finished its speech, the being turns and walks slowly towards the spacecraft, retracing the path it had already made previously. The children are amazed. This encounter that was so scary at the beginning, that one would rather not happen at all, was about to end. Seeing it leave, little Marco asks, almost anxiously, his friend Fernando close to him. Do you think he will come back? This simple, almost whispered question remains suspended for a few seconds in the air and, to the surprise of all the boys, the being turns to Marcos. With its head, it makes several vertical movements, as if nodding to Marco's question. Then, resuming its journey, it bends down over a flower bed and from it, with its left hand, picks up a plant. With this in its hands, it takes the last steps it needs to reach the point where it had descended. With its arm, it makes a brief gesture towards the spacecraft and the two beams of light reappear like jets, connecting the floating device to the ground. With the simplicity and lightness with which it had descended, the being flies upwards between the two bands of light, smoothly and always in an upright position. It is no longer looking at the children, but its head is raised to the sky. After returning to the device and sitting next to its companions, the children can still see the two beams of light, even if now they are a little faded. Immediately afterwards, the device emits a strong glow and rises silently in an oblique direction, towards the east, as it will be later ascertained, suddenly disappearing and hardly being noticed by the children, 
who remain amazed and now only illuminated by the moonlight. After a few moments, as if a veil had been removed or the boys had been given permission to move again, the children feel free and, that feeling of calmness disappearing, they immediately run into the house, crying out for Donna Maria, the brother's mother, almost screaming. The woman, who was putting her youngest son to bed in a room near the back entrance, had not noticed any change in the environment during the few minutes that the strange encounter had taken place in the courtyard, except for a strong and short flash of light coming from the window. That flash, however, was strange, the woman will later explain, because there was no possibility that a car headlight could hit the windows of the house and therefore produce that light. But the woman hadn't paid much attention to this until the children entered the house screaming, Mum! Mum! Come and see what a horrible thing! In addition to the agitation and pallor of her children, what impresses Donna Maria is the fact that their neighbour, little Marcos, running into the house with the other boys, goes directly to hide under one of the beds, where he seems to cower in terror. Although he was still young, the woman remembers never having seen Marcos so scared as to hide under a bed. They would even have to go and call his father on the street corner to get him out of hiding. At the time of the incident, Mr. Alcides, the father of the brothers Fernando and Ronaldo, is, like any other evening, in the neighbourhood bar, talking with some friends. Suddenly, one of his little daughters comes running into the bar. Her mother had sent her to get him. Dad, some strange people have entered our backyard. Not understanding what the girl is saying, the man immediately runs back home, scared, where he tries to get the boys to explain what had happened. After several minutes of disbelief, the man is led into the courtyard and examines the ground, following the directions of the children. On the smooth, beaten earth, he can make out several small triangle-shaped marks along the path that the strange being, described by his children, had travelled. The footprints are quite deep, about one and a half centimetres in size, and make the father think that only something very heavy could have created them. The boy's father, on that same night, will go back to his friends in the bar to tell the amazing story that had happened to his children. But, despite the invitation to go and see with their own eyes the indisputable signs left by the extraterrestrial, their reaction, as well as that of the entire neighbourhood, would be one of complete disbelief, and neither the father nor the children will be taken seriously. Only one former neighbour will want to be shown, that same night, the footprints left in the garden. As for their mother, Donna Maria, her concern will increase when she realises that, for some time, the boys will refuse to go into the courtyard at night, which is completely contrary to their habits. Although the woman will also confide with her neighbours about the unusual behaviour of her children, no one will listen to her and their attitude will mainly be one of disbelief. Donna Maria will say that facing this attitude, Fernando, the eldest son, used to react with a tone of pain and challenge with the following words. Don't they want to believe it? Well, one day they will end up seeing what we saw, and then it will become clear that we didn't lie.
Time has passed, and the children, now all grown up, after being contacted once more by the first investigator of the case, the ufologist Alberto Francisco do Carmo, absolutely insist that they would never have taken advantage of the incident, wanting to go on and live their lives. Marcos, who had become an industrial designer, was always the most demanding, starting from the sketches he had made of that meeting at the age of seven, until he was no longer afraid of anything and worked in Iraq during the conflict with Iran for a Brazilian road and bridge builder. Ronaldo had become a gem setter at a jewelry store. And Fernando, a mechanical technician, very competent and proud of never having been unemployed, having acquired a good reputation, generally respected as a professional. Furthermore, among the various investigations that followed the event, Julio Brandt Alaixo, the founder of Chicoani, the Center for Civil Investigation of Unidentified Flying Objects, among the first to be interested in the case, carried out an interview with the boys two years after their encounter with the extraterrestrial being, who showed up in their courtyard that evening of August the 28th, 1963. Just as happened that evening, this interview also took place in the backyard of the house. All the children were gathered and were ready to share their version of the facts. What differences did you note among the people who were in the apparatus? The man sitting at the end was stouter. There was also a woman with her hair stretched backwards. Did you notice other differences? No, they were all alike. The men were without hair. You said that at a certain moment, two luminous bands reached down from the apparatus to the ground, and between them, a man stepped down a stairway. There was no stairway. So then, did the man fall down to the ground heavily? He didn't fall. He descended without moving his legs, and he touched the ground slowly. Did he immediately walk in your direction? Yes. Please, do imitate for us the walk. Fernando approaches the avocado tree and walks back slowly, with stiff movements of his arms far from his body. Here, he says, indicating the ground, he slipped twice on the limestone. Were all of the man's movements so slow? No, sometimes he moved fast, but he seemed to have difficulties in bending his arms. Why do you think so? Fernando then produces some of the gestures the being made. A series of hand gestures, rapid, horizontal and circular. In reproducing the gesture of being tired, made by the being, its hands, pressed together, are not able to get too close to its head. Did the man also make movements with its head? When he was looking and speaking to us, once in a while, he moved his head very much. You said that the man stopped on this spot of the cistern, when he arrived there, and then successively bent forward to catch Marcos, who was at the other side of the cistern, and so approximately 1.5 meters away from the man. How could a man reach so far? But he was very big. How big? The size of that door, he says, pointing to his house. Afterwards, you pushed Marcos away from the man. What then did the latter do? He moved his hands like this. Fernando then reproduces the horizontal rapid movements. 
After that, my fear was gone. Then he sat down here. The boy indicates the edge of the cistern and shows how the man was sitting with his shoulders to the boys. While he was looking up to the sphere above the avocado tree, I took up a piece of brick from the ground to throw it at him. When I raised my arm, he turned around quickly and a light reached my hand. The brick fell down and the hand began to tremble. What colour was that light? Yellowish. Where did it come from? From an object on its chest. An object similar to what? I don't know exactly. It had a quadrangular form, more or less. What did he do after this? Seemingly, he laughed. Why seemingly? It was a strange laugh. His mouth moved much and opened this way. The boy then shows his mouth opening vertically. How were the man's eyes? He had only one. Here. Fernando points to the base of his nose and Ronaldo nods, agreeing with him. Did he have eyebrows? He had something like it above the eye, which moved once in a while when he was frowning his forehead. And eyelashes, as those of our own eyes. I have the impression that he had one. What colour was his eye? It was dark. Did he have that white part? No, it was all dark and round, like this. The boy then points to a sketch made earlier by Marcos, who had drawn the eye, about one inch in diameter, circular in shape and with a darker horizontal line instead of the pupil. And how was his nose? I don't know. So you state to have seen his mouth and eye, and now you can't describe his nose. Didn't you see two openings just above the mouth? I don't remember to have seen a nose. And the ears, what did they look like? I also didn't see them. How could you fail to see the ears if the helmet was all transparent? I don't know. His face was all the same, red all over. The teeth, they were quite entirely white, he says with a certain admiration. He had these teeth here much bigger than the other ones, pointing to his canines. Marco then interrupts. No, the biggest ones were these ones, Marcos exclaims, pointing to his lower teeth. Fernando, you told us you saw the face of the man, the colour of his eye, of his teeth, his clothes, etc. Therefore, the light bulb in the backyard was on. It was off. How could you notice so many details if the man had his back from the light coming from the apparatus? But the light of the sphere was illuminating all this here. And there was also a little moonlight. And none of the neighbours came out of their homes to see this light. I didn't see any neighbour coming out into the backyards near our home. Fernando, you said that the man spoke to you while making gestures. Did you understand some of the words? No. Do you think that the man's language was similar to French, English or any other foreign language? I don't know. How was his voice? It was a very grave one. It was ten times graver than yours, Ronaldo interjects, referring to the Professor Julio's voice. While the man was on the ground, did you see the apparatus balancing above the tree? The apparatus didn't balance. And then what did the people still inside it do? One man, sitting in front, 
moved his hands at the inferior part of something similar to a television set. Fernando then reproduces the movement of hands moving swiftly over a keyboard. Did you see any figures on this television set? I was standing sideways, but I could see some lines passing. And the other people? What did they do? They just kept sitting on their seats. On chairs? No. There were no chairs. They were stalls, with one leg only. Is it true that when the man walked away and overheard Marcos's question, he made movements with his head? As the man began to move away, Marquinhos asked me, Do you think he will come back? Then the man made several movements with his head. Marcos, please repeat the question that you asked Fernando. And you, Fernando, will you please then imitate the man's movements? Do you think he'll come back again? Marcos asks his friend. Fernando turns his head towards Marcos and reproduces, silently, the movements the being made with its head. Now, Fernando, please do imitate the way the man went away. Fernando walks slowly towards the avocado tree. Halfway there, he stops, leans to his left and picks up a plant from the ground. What does that mean? In this spot, the man bent down and digged up a plant. Then he passed here and raised his arms. Fernando then imitates the gesture. And the two luminous bands would reappear. He ascended between them until reaching the sphere. And then? Then the light of the sphere became more intense and it began to ascend slowly. Suddenly there was a flash of light and the lights were switched off everywhere. The sphere disappeared here, behind the roof. At that moment, so it seemed, the wind blew. Are you not certain about that? I felt something in the air which made me think so. Fernando, look around here. How many people are here to hear your story? Around eight children from the neighbourhood, who knew about the detective's mission, followed them and were attending the interview. So, in addition to the three children, their parents, the four other small children and the members of Chicoani, a small crowd had formed around them, attentive and silent. However, the investigators noted that Fernando and his friends continued to maintain an unalterable spontaneity. Don't you think that when you invented such a tale, you could hurt yourself, as well as your family? Your parents already told me that your story is not true. If they told you so, I don't know this, but I am telling the truth. One of the last contacts with this story and with the boys was an inspection by two UFO enthusiasts in the Sagrada Familia neighbourhood in 2006. Led by an adult Marcos, they retraced the events of that fateful night. Going through the metal gate, there is uncultivated land where the foundations of an old house remain. Not far away, is a leafy avocado tree. It is still standing. If it could speak, it too would tell us what happened that night of August the 28th, 1963, Marcos comments, almost dreamily. I haven't been here for several years, and despite what happened, I have fond memories of my childhood in this neighbourhood of simple people. There was the well, and an old oil barrel where I went to collect the water to wash a coffee pot when it appeared. The man, now 48, remembers his childhood, poor but happy, playing with kites, spinning tops and earning some money to help the family by carrying the purchases of those who went to the markets. It took me a little longer to see the giant who was already walking on the ground, 
because my head was stuck in the mouth of the well. Later they would tell me that he had descended between two downward projecting yellow beams from the sphere suspended in the air. The three men cross the courtyard and Marcos tells them the rest of the events until they stop near the well. Will he come back again? I had asked Fernando and the being seemed to understand me because we immediately saw how it nodded its head answering my question. I mean, they will come back again, Marcos insists, staring at the avocado tree. The man explains that for a while the boys avoided leaving the house at night. Then fear turned into curiosity in the hope of their return, at least on his part. I sat on the railing of the balcony of my house, looking at the sky, hoping that one day those beings would return. Weren't you afraid of them coming back? asks one of the two UFO fans. No, because if they had wanted to hurt us, they would have done it that unforgettable day. I think they wanted to see how we lived, what we did. Do you still have hope that they will come back? Hope never dies. I'd like to see them again. It was very nice to remember the event in this place. Even if there is very little left of my friend's house. Mine was that one, the one on the corner, he points out emotionally. As I told you, childhood brings me good memories. Experiences like these are never easy to put behind us. There are those who at all costs want to go ahead and forget everything and those who get stuck in the past, trying to relive the event. What is certain is that this experience united the three boys even more. Whether it was a simple courtesy visit by some extraterrestrial alien form or something more, that night an important case of ufology took place in history. What remains, apart from the footprints still cemented in the courtyard, are the memories of a childhood, a friendship and a past that, for better or for worse, will not go away any time soon. As for the visitors, however, perhaps they are still out there and, as Marcos hopes, he would like to see them again. Or maybe they have already come back maybe not too far from the Sagrada Familia neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs>